Okay, so last time we spent all this, pretty much the whole class period, talking about electron correlation in the Hamiltonian and all the different levels of theory that we had um, and the more advanced calculations. I don't know if I should be prejudiced against it. Like to me, molecular mechanics and semi empirical are not advanced, and ab initio and different and density functional theory and those things are are what I would call advanced calculations. And for the advanced ones, you have to specify specifically what level of theory you're using and the basis set. So today we're going to talk about the basis set decision, and then we're going to look at some of the output from these programs. Okay, so this is L8, if you still have the notes. It's just the second half of L8. And so, so now we're going to get into the basis sets, and we have a lot of choices. If you look on here, these are, this is the drop-down box in Gauss view for basis sets. And, you know, what are you going to do with that? I mean, there's so many options. And so let's talk talk through some of the options. Um, there's, uh, you know, all of these are described in, in the uh, Gaussian user's manual. And you have access to that user's manual because the whole thing is put into the Gaussian program. And so we'll um, get you a copy to use here uh, at the university. We have a site license for Gaussian. And so then you can always use the help if you need to look up any of these, um, like you see it in a in a research article, that's probably the most common thing is if you're reading a research article and they used uh, CC-PVDZ and you're like, what on earth is that? Because Dr. Williams didn't talk about that one. Um, then you go to open the Gaussian program, go to help, Google, you know, or search in the help basis functions and you'll be able to get the detailed information on those. Uh, but let's give you the basics. So this uh, STO3G, that's the simplest one. And those are Slater type orbitals uh, modeled with three Gaussians. And so we call this the minimum basis set because it has those minimum atomic orbitals that you're familiar with. Okay. Now remember I said that these, these atomic orbitals that we're familiar with are really hydrogenic orbitals. So they're analytical solutions to the Schrodinger equation for hydrogen only. And so they're probably not going to model well things with two electrons, okay? They'll do okay, but uh, that's why we need all of these other basis functions, is to, to take into account the freedom of the electron that actually exists. These are too constraining to the electron. If you think about the p orbitals, really, uh, you know, without hybridization, those p orbitals can really only interact in 90 degrees to each other. And mixing them, you can get hybrid orbitals and you can get 109.5 degrees and so on. Uh, but even then, there's only so many things, only so much freedom you can give the electron because there's um, only so many orbital functions available. And so all of these other basis sets just give the electron more freedom. So that's the bottom line for all of the basis sets. The more freedom the electron has, the more accurate it's going to be to the actual molecular system because the electron in a real molecule has total freedom. It can go wherever the charges want it to go. And it's dominated by Coulombic charge, so pluses and minuses. You know, attraction to the nuclei and repulsion from the other electrons. Then we have split valence sets. Ian, can I get you to close the door for me, please? Thanks. So these with the dash in the middle are split valence uh, basis sets. They have a three and a two, or a six and a three, and the Gs always stand for Gaussians because that's what this uh, these functions are using to create their uh, atomic orbitals. And so six dash three one G. Six means there's six primitive Gaussians in the core. So in the core means, you know, uh, the 1s core on carbon. And then notice the valence electrons for carbon are in the, the two level, the period two. So um, they're using six Gaussians to model that 1s orbital. So that's kind of overkill for hydrogen, all right? But still, that's what they're using. And then they're using two, func two functions in the valence, uh, so for uh, the the uh, 2s and the 2p and the 2y and the 2z, um, 2py and 2pz, they're going to be using two um, Gaussians for each one of those. And so then 6-311 uh, would be called a triple zeta. So sometimes in the literature you'll see double zeta basis set or triple zeta basis set. What is the zeta? Well, in the 
exponent of this exponential, you have a little scaling factor as to how this electron, it's really the radial wave function, how the electron uh, wave function tapers off as you go to infinity. And, and so these, um, all of these different Gaussians have different little zeta values. And so you can have uh, one with like these three primitives for the, the steep part of the curve and then one for the gradual part of the curve. Let me show you what I'm talking about. So the analytical result for the hydrogen atom the radial distribution function is e to the minus r. And of course, there's lots of constants in there and a normalization factor, and, but the, the function is e to the minus r. And that drops off quite differently than e to the minus r squared. So a Gaussian is an e to the r minus r squared. Okay. And so I've just shown, say, like this red example here. So... So what we've done is we've taken this e to the minus r, and then we've put in another one with a slightly different zeta. So it's a little, uh, it tapers off a little um, sharper, and then another one sharper. And so what we've done is we've created this green curve that's a little taller than this e to the minus r. So here we've, just as an example, contracted three Gaussians together with different zetas and we've made this red curve a little bit steeper. It's a little closer to the blue line. So the blue line is the hydrogenic orbital. The green line is the contracted Gaussian, and these are three primitives below. So that's what we're talking about. When I say use three primitives for the core, they're creating this, this green curve and they're trying to approximate the blue curve. So we are trying to, like, so the closer you get to the analytical, the better? Yeah, it seems that way. Okay. So they, but they, what they've done is they've decided on these different zeta values for each of the atoms so that they could reproduce things like electron affinity, ionization potential, mm -hmm. and so on. So they, they don't exactly match the e to the minus r. They're optimized to reproduce the atomic properties. So they feel like they've got good functions for each of the atoms. And then if the, each of the atoms have good functions, then the molecules should have good functions. So what's that? This one here, this, it represents this, when we say contracted. So these three are combined to give you that one. And I haven't been able to find out whether they're added or, or whether they're um, uh, multiply. I think they're added. In this case, they're added. But in terms of what the actual is inside the Gaussian's engine, I exactly don't know how they are contracting these primitives to give you this um, contracted function. But that's what we're talking about here, uh, about contracted from three primitives and contracted from one primitive. That's the language that I'm trying to unpack a little bit, but I, exactly, I don't exactly know how it's implemented in Gaussian. But I do know it's trying to correct the Gaussian function to make it more, um, more accurate to what nature has in terms of its radial distribution function. So this is the radial. Do you understand what I mean by radial distribution? So you have the, uh, the radius of the atom. So this is R as we go out. And so it's this curve of that function and how it goes out. Now, notice this, this radial distribution function has a maximum, but then when I go to uh, look at the actual um, analytical solution, it goes up, it does not go to zero here. Now that's a common mistake. Like they'll point this out and they'll say, well, it says that the electron's most probable position if I, even if I were to square this wave function, uh, is going to be at the nucleus. And so what keeps the electron out of the nucleus? No, it's actually as, as you go towards the nucleus in a um, uh, spherical polar coordinate system, the volume actually shrinks to zero. And so it's a volume effect. So you take this um, R squared piece here, and so this is the volume piece. Well, what happened? So it goes up as R squared, 
And so when you take the volume in a spherical polar coordinate system into, into effect and multiply that by this wave function, you end up with this curve here. It, it goes up to a maximum and then comes back down. And that's what, that's then the most probable position for the electron right here. And so we would call that R0, that, that most probable diameter of the atom. If we wanted to draw the, the, say, the 1s orbital, where do we draw the circle, right? So we have the nucleus here. What is the radius? Right, because it's a wave function, right? So where is where do you draw the radius? You could draw the most probable, the top, you know, the, the, the height of that peak. If we were to square this peak, that maximum value is still going to be the maximum value. So that's that's the radial distribution function, the wave function squared, is going to tell us where the most probable place is. But a lot of times we come out here and we say, what's 95% of this area, right? That's also a particular radius. And so R95 is a lot of times where we draw these orbitals. So we go out there and we say, what, what volume what volume contains 95% of the distribution function, the probability distribution? Does that make sense? So we'll call this a 95% isosurface. And that's, um, <clears throat> that's where we draw these, these shapes. And that gives you a good idea of the size of the atom. That's why hydrogen is as big as Madisonville to um, what did I say, Madisonville to uh, Navasota, you know, or something like that. And then um, the sodium atom goes from Argentina to North Dakota or something like that. Is there any reason why they chose 95? It's just like 95% confidence. It's like mm -hmm. this volume has a 95% confidence uh, okay. of... So does the R square represent the, the probability? Like whenever you do the, um, the like whenever you put the equation on top of um, like something, you use that R square for the probability? <clears throat> no, this is R, this is radius squared. Oh, so this is, yeah, so I'll put R over here on the axis. axis. Yeah. Say 95 confidence, I'll say, okay, so we want yeah, <clears throat> yeah, good question. No, this volume goes as this radius squared. So it goes to zero at the nucleus. That seems to me that that argument has always been kind of um, weak, you know, just to say, well, the electron can't be in the nucleus because there's no volume there. Yeah. You said it, I was like, <laughs> it's like, but the nucleus is there. <laughs> right? But, but that is mathematically what's happening is that we take this wave function that that is an e to the minus r which has a, a non-zero result at the origin the origin is the nucleus so what keeps the electron out of the nucleus well um, if you were to integrate that you have to take into account the volume and that r squared dependence of the volume is what causes that that wave function to pinch to zero at the nucleus so it's kind of a, a weak argument for why the electron stays out of the nucleus um, Another one is the Heisenberg uncertainty principle, which is, again, if you uh, if the electron were in the nucleus, you would know where its position was <laughs> and oh, what its yeah. momentum was. <laughs> yeah, it's a stretch. No, my, I, mine is a sort of an existential thing. If the electron does make it to the nucleus, then it ceases to exist. It, it collides with the proton because that's what it's attracted to and it turns into a neutron and the element changes its identity in the periodic table. So uh, that's called electron capture, and it does happen. So yeah. you can see that in the heavier elements when you have so many protons, like electron uranium, you have 92 protons, 92 protons, and the 1s electrons, those two electrons, are going at relativistic speeds. They're going close to the speed of light. Yeah, and they can be sucked into the nucleus, and then the uranium loses one of its protons and becomes 91, which is, what is that? <laughs> yes, uh, what is that, protactinium, yeah. So it's it just slides one to the left. And it's kind of weird to think about, but that's what happens if the electron is captured in the nucleus. So it can happen even though there's zero volume. <laughs> yeah, so. And so then uh, we have the major sort of selection of the basis set which deals with the radial distribution function primarily and then we've got to think about the the angular momentum so 
the angular behavior of the wave function. And you're going to have your normal set of, of, of angular momentum functions, the, the spherical harmonics, to give you the s orbitals. You know, you're going to have the s orbitals and the p orbitals in, in these atoms. But you have the option of adding higher levels of, uh, of, of functions. So higher angular momentum can be added in on hydrogen and on heavy atoms. So heavy atoms is everything not hydrogen. So when Gaussian talks about heavy atoms, it just means everything but hydrogen. So that's kind of a broad definition of heavy atoms. It's not like heavy metals, you know, that uh, we talk about in toxicity. <clears throat> this is just anything but hydrogen. Now that saves a lot of computation time if you can treat hydrogens differently than the other atoms. Just think of uh, hexane, you know, you got six carbons and you've got 14 hydrogens. And so if you could just put the polarization functions on the carbons, which are probably the ones that really need it, um, then you could save your computation time. So Gaussian splits out hydrogens as unique. But for things like hydrogen bonding and so on, maybe you want to put uh, p, p orbitals on your hydrogens to allow some directionality to their bonding. And so this just gives the the electron more freedom. It gives you good, you know, ability to model odd angles like in cyclopropane. So these are some options. You can type in whatever combination of orbitals you want, but you know, simplest is just to add d orbitals. So this gives carbon d orbitals. Now it's not really going to put an electron in a d orbital that would be energetically unfavorable, but it might use 10% of a d orbital. So this allows them to mix in tiny little percentages of all of these orbitals. If you don't allow this D here, then carbon can't bond in, in those kinds of weird angles using the D orbitals. Okay. That would really be important for things like transition states where you might have five coordinate carbon. <laughs> okay, does carbon typically form five directional bonds? Not really, not in a ground state, but in transition states, it might want to have that ability okay then diffuse functions these are helpful for anions and uh, things that are going to want to have a, a larger extent of the electron cloud so this extends the radial distribution function by adding some more functions onto the to the atoms and once again uh, heavy atoms or or not so the heavy atoms are always first, and so this would be all the atoms that are not hydrogen with the first plus, and then all atoms. So the second one would be adding diffuse functions to hydrogen. So you can put a plus in between the 6-31G and the, and the D and the P, or you can put two pluses. <clears throat> so here's what it looks like. So you can, you can put these plus signs right here in between. So when you see a, um, a basis set that has these extra pluses in there, you know they're adding on diffuse functions. And here's a good monster basis set for good energies. This has diffuse functions on heavy atoms and on hydrogen, okay? And it's got uh, adding in the 3d orbitals and f orbitals onto the heavy atoms and the 3p orbitals and d orbitals onto the hydrogens so it's giving like two sets of p orbitals or three sets of p orbitals onto all of these atoms so here's the sort of a rundown on basis sets if you have huge systems like 200 to 2000 atoms you're probably going to be using molecular mechanics or semi-empirical methods so uh, you really don't have to specify basis sets for those because they come with their own basis sets. But then if you're looking for anions, you'd want to use diffuse functions. If you have strained rings or transition states, you want higher polarizability um, or higher angular, higher angular momentum functions. And then this, uh, this suggestion in this latest book, the third edition of Forsman, is suggesting a triple zeta basis set. So that's how they would talk about it in the literature. 
diffuse functions on heavy atoms. I just call them heavies. Okay. And then uh, getting into the d orbitals um, and p orbitals on d orbitals on heavy atoms. and p orbitals on hydrogen. The, the, the reason you don't want to add all these extra functions, just to, unless you have to, you don't need to. Yeah, it's a great question. Form. Let me let me rephrase your question. How will we know which ones to use? Like, yeah. when is it too much? Right. Okay. Um, you typically find, uh, first of all, just like in science, you're going to want to repeat an experiment before you go off on your own, right? So if you're gonna do a synthesis, you're gonna repeat a synthesis that you know works, okay? Same thing in computational chemistry. Before you go off on your own and try to calculate delta H for your research reaction or something, you're gonna to wanna to calculate the delta H of a system that you know about, okay, that's in the literature. So you're gonna to try to repeat the calculations that are in the literature. So you pick one of those particular calculations that you know the answer to, okay? And then you, you um, crank up the basis set or sh shrink it down. You go either higher or lower until the answer gets worse. Like if you go lower and the answer immediately gets worse, you know you're at the minimum acceptable level. If you go up in basis set and add diffuse functions and polarizability and the answer gets even better, okay, then maybe you need to go to that level. So you keep cranking them up until you get to the point where you say, all right, this is good enough in terms of my answer. Now, um, that good enough may also incorporate how long it took to do the calculation. And so adding these extra functions really, strength, really lengthens the calculation time. And so you say, well, I'd like to have 5% error on, on average for my calculations, but that would take you know, several days for every molecule. And if I could just get rid of the diffuse functions and the and maybe the polarization functions on, on hydrogen, now I can do my molecule in, in a couple hours and my error is only 10%. And so to get within 10% of the right answer, you could do your calculation in a few hours. You might decide that that's good enough. And that little study you would write up, that would be part of your paper. Because that's the question, how did you decide on your basis set? And so you would say, balancing computational cost and accuracy, we arrived at this model chemistry. And then you decided on your model chemistry, and then you use it for all of your work. Yeah. And, and you probably, you know, if, if you're going to do a full big paper with computational chemistry, you probably want to have more than just one um, model system that you worked on, you know, like, we had uh, this type of molecule, this type of molecule, and that surrounds all of our types of molecules that we're interested in. Something, say, maybe aromatic and something with um, the functional group we want. And so you might test a couple of right answers on both of those and make sure your basis set is accurate for molecules that bracket your study. And then you're confident if it's 10% right, or, or say 90% right on all of these test molecules on surrounding our molecules of interest, then we're pretty confident that it'll be 90% right for our unknowns. Make sense? So it is a balance of computational cost and accuracy. Now, some of that's been done for us. You can look through that Forsman book where, you're, where it talks about selecting a basis set, and it'll have a whole catalog of types of molecules. And the, the mean deviation and the maximum deviation in this whole set of molecules and it'll say this basis set gave us really good results for this huge suite of molecules and so they help you select that way too and then if you're going to write your paper you need to say well we use the suggestions in this book you know electronic structure methods by Forsman and Fritch uh, to select our basis set because our molecules behave they're all normal and this did really well on normal molecules 
And so we're just going to use that basis set. So that's how you decide. Because, yeah. yeah, you're right. If you want to have a perfect basis set, well, then you just include everything. But then your computer is locked up for, you know, two days calculating methane. <laughs> you know, <laughs> so it's not going to give you very much. And so the model chemistry have both this level of theory and a basis set. The molecular mechanics have their own basis sets and semi-empirical uh, calculations have their own basis sets. But ab initio and DFT, uh, you have to have the level of theory and the basis set. And this is typically how it's written. It's level of theory slash basis set. So this is, uh, this is the shorthand here. And I say this is the industry standard, but now enforcement uh, is changing this. <laughs> He's trying to. It's the A, P, F, A, A. let's see, it's, it's earlier on the slide. Let me go back, A, P, F, D. So that's a density functional method and he's saying 6-311G plus 2DFP, I think. Oh, it's not. 2D and P, okay. <laughs> Thanks. Oh, I should have put my phone on mute for a second. That's my text tone. Okay, so that's, I haven't run those calculations yet because I, I don't know, so I don't know how long they'll take on a PC, but we can we can pull the, the computers out soon and we'll test some simple molecules on there and see how long they take. Now this CBS QB3 is a really complex job for small molecules. Um, you know, that. If you were doing atmospheric chemistry and trying to get reaction rates for ozone depletion and you had tiny little molecules and so on, then you could use some of these complex, uh, you know, jobs that, that are really compound jobs. They do a geometry and a frequency and they do a bunch of different steps and refine that and expand the basis set and so on. Um, but that's going to be for really small molecules. It's not going to be, if you put CBS QB3 in for one of uh, Dr. Gross's uh, benzoxyboranes or whatever those things are. <laughs> I don't know. I, you'd graduate before it was finished. <laughs> and, so, and so obviously we want to compare molecules with the same model chemistry. So here's your selection guide. If you have huge polymers or crystals or something, you want to use UFF. Um, polymer segments, or dimers, trimers, and so on. Maybe AM1. Um, medium systems, that APFD. Um, and then this down here, this is interesting. This MMQM or Oniom methods, these are interesting and they, they actually won the Nobel Prize for this. So there was, it's really a cool thing. They, like the inventors of Gaussian and a lot of people that work on computational chemistry finally had a Nobel Prize associated with their work. Because what this does is they, they figured out in the software how to incorporate both molecular mechanics and quantum mechanics in the same calculation, which that's phenomenal. If you think about uh, hemoglobin as a good example and its association with, with iron and oxidizing oxygen, or, you know, uh, using oxygen to generate energy and so on, the way that um, that interaction of that molecule, that, that that oxygen comes in and the iron center and this this heme system that's incorporated in a huge protein okay there's a huge you want to be using quantum mechanics for the iron center and the oxygen but you don't want to be using quantum mechanics for the backbone of the polymer or the you know the protein or even maybe even the porphyrin ring and so is the geometry important and so on this allows you to set up layers in your calculation and you can select atoms and put them in the quantum mechanics layer and apply 
like one of these quantum mechanics methods. And then you could select all the other atoms and apply molecular mechanics to them. So the backbone and everything, it ignores all of the electrons in the backbone of the polymer and lets it optimize. But then when it gets down to the active site, it's able to use quantum mechanics. So that's pretty cool. Yeah, and so they that's such a huge computational advance that they got awarded the Nobel Prize. So that's good for them. And, and Gaussian allows you to do that. So this idea of, of you know, electron correlation, if you were able to, to figure it out, at least use a numerical system that gave you complete electron correlation and put in a complete basis set, then you would have a complete solution to the Schrodinger equation. But the calculation time goes to infinity. <laughs> okay. And so that's frustrating, but that's the reality. So what they'll do is they'll, they'll take a low level electron correlation and that uh, CBS QB3 method I was talking about was really advanced. It marches along and sees what the basis set effect would be. And then at a really low level of theory, and then it picks a low basis set and marches along and sees what the advanced electron correlation methods would be. And then it extrapolates. It tries to extrapolate to uh, down here where it, where it can't really calculate. And so it's, it's a pretty advanced method to try to get closer to the, the true solution of the Schrodinger equation. So that's it for basis sets. Now let's look at the job types that we have and their output. So here's the, the first tab on that calculation setup. We really spent most of our time on this method tab picking basis set and theory and so on. But let's look at the job type. If you click on this job type, you get a bunch of options. Energy, you can do optimization of the structure, you can calculate the vibrational frequencies, but most of the time you wanna do both of those. And so you have this option of opt plus freak. In the old days, you had to set up both jobs independently and then link them in the program where they would run one after the other. But now it's that's such a common procedure that they just push both jobs together and they do the linking for you. So it's very nice. It's still two calculations, but Gaussian handles handles the linking of one to the other automatically. Uh, there's also an NMR simulation that you can do with that job tab. Then you have the title tab. You can go in here and add anything you want to keep, you know, it's really for your records. Um, I like to avoid using any special characters because sometimes those special characters are useful for searching through other areas of the code, uh, like the the pound sign or the hashtag. And so we, um, I, it's just as a pro tip, don't use that in your job titles. This link zero tab is where the checkpoint file name is designated. And so this is the checkpoint file is a really important piece of uh, your calculation, even though you, you, you may not use it the first few times you use Gaussian, it contains all the molecular orbital data. And, and so you need that checkpoint file if you're gonna explore the molecular orbitals. And we'll, we'll play around with that in the future. It's also where the geometry is stored from job to job. So if you finish one job, the MOs and the geometry are written to the checkpoint file and then the log file is produced. And then when you wanna start a new um, calculation, you can pull the geometry from that checkpoint file. So you don't have to go in and like copy paste, it does it for you. So let's talk about computational times. This is on TATB, which has 300 basis functions. And some of these CPU times were are, are, are my CPU times, at least starting right here. So this is, this is my work in this table here. So DW. This is when I started using Gaussian. Now I was working on a 486 computer. Um, it was uh, it was overclocked, so we we put in a, 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 a I forget how we did it, but we replaced the chip. I don't know if we replaced the processor or, or or some other chip in there, but it was it was overclocked at, at 50 megahertz. Wow, not even a gigahertz. Yeah. <laughs> Slow down. <laughs> yeah, I know. It. And it took 20 hours on, on this. Okay, 20 hours on, on this PC version of, uh, of Gaussian. Now, early on, I started out with this first 
version of, of a Gaussian type program. It wasn't Gaussian, but it was same first kind of electronic structure on this system I never even heard of, the CDC 1604. And it took greater than months to finish something on the order of TATB. Um, VAX, the, the VAX system, again, was like a supercomputer, um, took a week. The Cray is definitely a supercomputer, one hour and a Cray uh, in 92 with software advancements took nine minutes. So incredible speed up from months to nine minutes. Then we got fast enough to put this code onto PCs. And so then still for, for a PC, it was 20 hours. And then years later, uh, it took 2.6 hours. I thought I was really doing great then, man. In 94, it was so great. And then I got 98 Windows version on a Pentium 3, 500 megahertz. And it was 24 minutes. And I was so happy. <laughs> and, and then Gaussian 03 on a Pentium 5, 3 gigahertz machine, less than five minutes. So I had a student when he first got here, this is 2004, do a calculation for me on these polymer pieces. And he had a, um, a diphenyl methylene structure, which is the hard segment, and then these butyl pieces that come off. And so it said two benzene rings joined by a methane group in the middle, methyl group, and then uh, these uh, benzene, uh, a butyl, ring, butyl um, attachments on the ends of the ring. So not a huge molecule. It took two weeks of CPU time. Two weeks. So it's just cranking away on that PC for two weeks. And occasionally up here in 321, you'll see people put signs up. Please don't disturb the Gaussian calculation going on. You know, some of them can take weeks of CPU time. And so if I take that two weeks and put it on this same graph and run it backwards, that would have been 1,500 years for the polyatom. Which kind of breaks your brain, doesn't yeah. it? I mean, that's like a Doctor Who thing. It's like if you just wait 30 years or 40 years, you can do this in two weeks. If you start this calculation now, it'll take 1,500 years. But if you wait 30 years, now 40 years, you know, uh, you can do it in two weeks. 1,500 years, that's sort of an idea of how technology advances. Yeah. That's what... Yeah. You know, it's just unbelievable. When we see months to minutes, we don't really think about it, but two weeks of CPU time extrapolated back is in, you know, over a thousand years. I mean, this is gonna sound dumb, but if you think of it in the, in the gaming terms, like in 80, 80 86, yeah. it's Nintendo, like it's all six bits and eight bits out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But as you go further down, you go into the 16th and the 32s and the 64th. Yeah, yeah, that's, yeah. That's why I can quote you this as, that's how you can actually reduce the time. Okay. So I know, I mean, I'm sorry for kind of getting off track here, but this is, again, like you're saying yeah. with gaming, the real realism, okay? My son bought an Oculus, you know, uh, 3D headset. Man, they're awesome, okay? It's so immersive. I'm playing super hot, you know, where you got to battle these guys and everything, and they're shooting bullets at you, and I'm, I'm stuck in an elevator. Three guys are shooting at me, okay? And I'm looking around, and they shoot at me. And so I get out of the way, and the bullet comes through. And then I look again, and I throw my Chinese star or whatever it is. And then I miss, you know, and then another bullet comes through. And I'm like, if I could get to the other side of the elevator, I could have a better vantage, right? And so I'm going to jump, right? No. I jump, right? I'm not in an elevator. I'm in my living room. And I jump onto the hearth of my fireplace where his oh, computer God. was sitting. I put my knee through his monitor. <laughs> <laughs> that is That's how immersive it is. Crazy. Which is what you're saying from from six bit, eight bit sound, you know, Super to to fully immersive to where my heart rate's going, you know, and I'm I'm trying to win this game, you know. And I jump, and I mean, I, it was a great fall. And I was like, bam, bam, rolled around. And Thomas was like, whoa. <laughs> and game over. His monitor was wrecked, man. Good old eBay. We The reason we got Dell laptops is because Thomas, through the high school here, got to this Dell certified technician. And he was like, Psh, it's bad, but, you know, we can get on eBay and 150 bucks, buy a new monitor, and I can install it. And so... Three days later, he popped the top off and screwed in the new monitor, plugged it in, and good as new. So, but I was embarrassed. Oh my gosh. <laughs> I was so bad. I wonder how hard it would be to convince the IT people 
to load Gaussian on the server and then farm it out to all the PCs that are idle? Yeah, well, that, that's, yeah, there's some definitely, on, on the yeah. Campus. Yeah, I don't know that if they've ever implemented anything with like screensavers, but there are calculation groups that have done that for molecular mechanics calculations. Uh, yeah. SETI, so for SETI, and there's one called um, uh, Rosetta at home, which allows you to solve protein structures as a screensaver. Yeah. So this is what the OptFreak calculation is doing. So you input the nuclear coordinates, and then you uh, calculate the energy, calculate the gradient. So how did the energy change with respect to the nuclear positions? And then you see if you're at a minimum. <clears throat> you change that geometry and start over. So this is an iterative loop. And an, until you discern, determine that you're at a, at a geometric minimum, then you keep going. So what is a geometric minimum? Well, it's a, it's a place where there are no, no forces on the atoms. So like you can calculate the electron cloud and if the atom's over here and all the electrons over here, there's a force on that nucleus pulling it towards the electron density. If it gets inside the electron density and there's another nucleus over there, then there's repulsion and it's pushing it back. So somewhere in between these two points is a minimum, and there'll be no forces on the nucleus. Um, it also, if it's, it calculates the gradient, which is the force on this nucleus, and, and it calculates the next step. So even if there's a, a, a tiny force on the nucleus, what's the next step? And if it's essentially not a, much of a change in geometry, then uh, it's, it's going to say it's at a minimum. So it never reaches perfect minimum, it gets below a certain criterion, like below a certain amount of force on the nuclei, below a certain distance that they would want to jump if they were allowed to jump again. And, and so we call that a minimum. And there's, uh, uh, I think it's on Wednesday, I go through the output file and we actually see the criterion in the output file. So let's say we've reached a minimum, the next calculation, totally different job, is a frequency calculation. This does the second derivative with respect to the uh, motions of the nuclei, and that's where we get the vibrational motion. Um, and so it also tests for negative frequencies. If there are negative frequencies, uh, which means you're at the, at the top of a hill, not at the bottom. So think of a parabola going this way. You have real um, uh, frequencies, real vibrational frequencies. But if the parabola is going down, there we go, then you have ones that are less than zero. They're negative frequencies. And so that's what we call imaginary frequencies. And if you have those, then you've got a, you, Gaussian thought it was at a minimum, but it wasn't. It was at the maximum with respect to one coordinate, which again has a force of zero and so on. And most of the time that's Gaussian's getting stuck there because you've told it to maintain symmetry. Like, um, let's think of uh, like toluene. So you've got this benzene ring here and a threefold uh, methyl group on the end. If you put build it a certain way, it could be CS symmetry as a mirror plane. And, and if Gaussian is only, if it's been told to maintain symmetry, it's only going to jump to places that are CS. It won't rotate that off axis to lower the energy because you've told it to stay at a CS um, structure. So you may want to reduce the symmetry and kick that methyl group a little bit off the plane, you know, one of those bonds out of the plane, and then it'll be able to find the minimum. <clears throat> and then you change the geometry, then you go back through the optimization step and then to the frequency step, and eventually you get to the point where there are no negative frequencies. And you would call that a global minimum, but you're really not sure if you have a lot of dihedrals. So, <clears throat> so then you have the optimized geometry and energy data. And on Wednesday, so we're not having class Monday, but on Wednesday, we'll go through um, all of the output and we'll look at, at some of these um, figures that I'm about to show you here. So some of these post-calculation options, our class is going to simulate the spectra. We're going to simulate IR, Raman, UV vis for sure, and maybe NMR. Um, then we can look at molecular orbitals, all of them, occupied and unoccupied. Uh, we can look at the electron density surface, which is sort of a picture of the electron cloud, and then the electrostatic potential map. So let's, I'm going to run through these really quick, so we only have about four minutes, but uh, I'll just give you some, some 
tips on how to understand these different things that come out. So here are the molecular orbitals. Once again, I like to picture this as a shrinking and a, an expansion. So yeah, the one on the uh, left is expanding in all directions. The one on the right, one side shrinking while the other side expands. And so that electron density is sloshing left and right in the y direction on, on water. So we can look at those, we can see that there's directionality to them and, and symmetry to them. Here's the electron density surface. And so notice there's, this is benzoic acid. Um, I have here, let's see. Yeah, this is the iso value 0 0.01 and this is 0 0.05. And so you can, you can think of this as a 99% surface. Remember I said earlier, we would, where do we draw the line? We, this, this cloud contains 99% of the electron density. This is a 0.05 surface, so this contains 95% of the electron density. Okay. We can see even smaller ones here, like this is an example of, a, of a, like cyclohexanone. This is an 80% surface. So all like 80% of the electron density is just in the core electrons. So this is, you know, this is the core electrons. And that's 80% of the electron density. Oh, oh no, 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 no. Sorry, 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 sorry. No, th let's start it over here. This is 95% of the electron density. Okay, yeah, so then this right here is, um, uh, it's the ISO surface of 0.6, so that's 40%. Yeah, and this is 20%. Okay. <clears throat> Notice how the 95% matches the space filling model pretty well. And so they're all model kits with the space filling, uh, balls that snap on, um, that's that's a pretty good picture of how puffy the molecule is. And then you can use the electron density to kind of understand uh, electron withdrawing or electron donating. Look at HF and compare it to lithium hydride. <laughs> and this tells you why we call it lithium hydride. Look, this is the hydrogen and it has most of the electrons, <laughs> right? It's, it's pulled hydrogen, or pulled electrons away from the lithium, whereas HF, the electrons are pulled more towards the fluorine. And then if we walk around that electron density with, say, a positive charge and see what the forces are, we can tell if that, that part of the electron density with the, with the positive charges on the inside, on those nuclei, if those positive charges are shielded by the electrons or not. And up here, this is negative. And so there's a lot of electrons here that are shielding those positive charges. And over here where the hydrogens are, um, there's not a lot of electrons shielding those hydrogens. So these are positive areas. So the blue is colored for positive and the, the red color is for negative. This again will tell you where uh, an electrophile would be attracted. It would be attracted to the top and bottom of the rings, and a nucleophile would come in and, and like to interact with the hydrogens. And we can see this, you know, where, again, on the larger molecule, positive and acidic proton right here, if ever there was one. It's, the electrons have been pulled towards the ring and exposed that hydrogen, and it's, it's, a, it's able to be removed by a base. So if a base comes along, it's going to steal that hydrogen from benzoic acid. And, the, and just the rest is just showing you some stuff about uh, what we can get out of Gaussian. We can get potential energy surfaces. We can get transition states. And then the last set of notes just kind of shows you how good it is for bond lengths and vibrational frequencies. So. So we won't have class on Monday, but we'll see you on Wednesday.